Well, good morning and uh, Merry Christmas. Glad you're, you're here with us this morning. And uh, here's what I want to say is uh, if you are from out of town and you got here early for Christmas, we're really glad you joined us uh, this morning. And my name is Jake. I'm the student and family pastor here at Faith uh, and our regularly scheduled guy, uh, Stephen, is celebrating Christmas early uh, with his family in Texas and we'll be back for Christmas Eve and next Sunday uh, here. But today, today you, get, uh, you get me. So uh, I'm looking forward to spending some time. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking forward to spending some time uh, with you guys. And this series is called Wonder, and it's all about, uh, it's all about Christmas. Imagine that. It's that time of year. Uh, but this series, what we've been doing is we've been looking at what the Old Testament says about, uh, about Jesus, and we've been carrying it over to, uh, over to what, it, what Jesus did, what Jesus accomplished. Uh, and so we've talked about uh, a number of different things from the book of Isaiah, and we've got one more for you today where we're just going to look at what it means, for, uh, what it means that God is Emmanuel, uh, what it means that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, but before I do that, what I want to do is, uh, is I want to take you through just a little journey that I've been on over the last year, and, and I'd love to invite you into that and, and get you to, uh, let you get to know me a little, bit, uh, a little bit more. But what I was thinking about as I was preparing for this week and looking over, uh, looking over the passages from Isaiah that, uh, that Stephen assigned me, uh, I, I realized very quickly why I got assigned them. Uh, I went, okay, thanks, man. And I uh, got to read through them and start thinking about my journey over the last year and go, okay, this is, this is how I can maybe start to unpack some of this. And so here's what happened is uh, January 24th of this year, uh, I was in the back of this room getting ready to do uh, a training with all of our children's ministry uh, volunteers. And what I get to do is uh, I come to the training to do one part of it, uh, because for some reason over the last four or five years, uh, pretty reluctantly, I've, I've become like the, the spokesperson for uh, kids and students Going through, going through and experiencing uh, trauma, whether that be physical abuse or sexual abuse. Um, and, and that sounds like really big and scary at first, because it is really big and scary at first. Uh, but what that means is, uh, is we've got a children's ministry and a youth ministry uh, that has amazing leaders that uh, love your students and kids well, and they feel safe, and they share their deepest hurts, right? Uh, and so that's why I'm okay being that person. Uh, but the, the uncomfortable part is that means I get to come and do a lot of training about it for or our youth team and our children's team. And uh, I stood in the back uh, getting ready to do a training I'd done a bunch of times before. And all of a sudden, uh, I, I just got panicked uh, and started, uh, started like getting hot and going, oh my gosh, like what am I about to do? Am I really the, the right person to give this training? How have I hurt people before? What have I done wrong? What do, why, why do I get to do this or why should I do this? Um, and so what I did is I, I headed back to my office and grabbed a water and paced the hallway for a few minutes to try to just go like, what is happening uh, inside? And, uh, and here's what I realized is like many of you, uh, I, had spent, uh, I had spent part of COVID processing with my wife, Kaylee. Not you guys didn't process with her. You processed with people you know. Um, but I've spent time processing with her and realizing like I have past uh, trauma and hurt. Uh, I have past regret and mistake. Uh, I have things that I haven't really dealt with that I just like shoved into a hole and went, that'll, that'll stay. And, uh, and then what happened is, and this is actually true, uh, as I started processing stories with people, uh, you hear trauma that they've been through and that they've experienced, and, uh, and then you're actually supposed to process that too. Didn't know if you knew that, um, and I didn't. And so what I would do is I would hear it, maybe I'd share about it briefly with one trusted safe person, and then I would shove it down in the same hole. Uh, and it doesn't really work if you do that. Uh, and what happens is, what happened that night, uh, it, it all of a sudden started like bubbling over and exploding in my life uh, and realizing I hadn't processed things the way I should have. Uh, doing what I do all the time, but I even do more regularly now, where maybe I hear the worst story, and I'm, I'm empathetic with the individual that maybe would be considered a, a victim in the story, but then all of a sudden I start connecting myself to the other person. Uh, and I start going like, oh my gosh, what, what one thing have I done that's close to that? And, and maybe, maybe, maybe I'm a lot closer to them, and maybe I'm more like them than I think I am. And Kaylee will regularly remind me, like, hey, chill. Uh, just because you're dealing with this doesn't mean that you've done those things. And it's like, well, you're right, but, but like, what if? What if? What if? And I live in that world forever. 
And what I realized that day was uh, I, I changed the training. All of a sudden, as I'm kind of having this panic in the back of the room, uh, it was my time. And so I walked up on stage and was nervous on stage even. And I've taught on this stage a ton. Uh, I've been on stages teaching since I was like 16. And, uh, and this was different. And training is always different than teaching, but uh, in this case, it felt really, really different. And I was nervous through the whole thing, but I did it entirely differently than I had done it before. Because here's what I realized, uh, is, is I'm capable of getting taken advantage of, and I'm also capable of taking advantage of people. I think we actually all are. Uh, but as I looked at that, I realized, uh, man, that's okay, and God was doing a good thing in my life, and I changed the way that I did the training. Multiple people, two different people, came up and told me about experiences from their life, uh, and that was actually really encouraging to hear and go, oh my goodness, like, uh, uh, there's, there's more of these people, and talking about trauma, people realize it's okay to talk about trauma. And, and then people came up and encouraged and just said, thank you for the training. But I left wondering, like, what the heck just happened? And uh, I came in on Monday, and it didn't feel better, and Tuesday didn't feel better. And so I actually walked into Weston's office and said, hey, I I need, we just got to talk. And so I kind of laid out what I was feeling for him. And what was amazing is uh, he uh, he talked God's word over my life. He talked the power of Jesus over my life. He prayed for me. And then he said, hey, have you thought about this thing uh, called counselors? Uh, and I went, that's a good idea. And so uh, I went and saw this guy uh, who, who I, I feel like, I wish we met before you were my counselor because I want to hang out with you. Uh, but now we can't because, you know, laws or something. But there is, uh, but the truth is I went and saw him Friday still. I, I see him regularly because what's good is it's good for me to process my life. But I also uh, get to be better as a youth pastor and better as a pastor for, for students because I get to hear their stuff too and I have the place to just uh, to be released of, what that, of that trauma too. Uh, but like I said, I share that because here's what I do is it took me months to feel normal again. Uh, my family, especially my wife, uh, knew. Uh, friends knew uh, uh, and, and staff knew and they were gracious and processed well with me. But it took me months to feel normal again. And what I was most concerned about was this thing of like, I, I think I'm right where God wants me. I think I have, I'm thinking about the church where God wants me. I think I have the job that God wants me. And I think I'm leading the teams that God wants me to lead. I think I'm working with students that God wants me to work with. And if that's true, how come I can feel panic? How come I can be afraid? How come, how come all of those things are true? If God has me here, why do I feel that way? And, uh, and here's what I know is uh, uh, there's, a, there's a, lot of, a lot of things in our life um, that, that can cause those feelings. Um, and, and here's what I know is those feelings can come up even while we're right in the middle of what God has for us. Uh, and what that really just means is life is really confusing. <laughs> uh, and, and I think even as a Christian, life is really, really confusing. Uh, we all have things we're not proud of. Uh, We all have uh, moments of fear and anxiety and panic and worry and stress. We're all been there. And uh, and we can, and and sometimes people would try to point out that if you feel that way, uh, you're not, you're not in the middle of what God would have for you. And what I would tell you is I don't, I don't think that's true. Um, I think, I think life is confusing and we can be right in the middle of what God has for us and yet, uh, and yet still feel fear. And so today's big idea is this, uh, Jesus is God with us in our fear. And maybe you want to change the word fear to panic or anxiety or worry or stress or whatever. And all of those words actually probably fit. Um, And this is the one place where I took uh, liberty and changed the phrase because uh, I didn't want to jump to the end. I think sometimes people would want to jump to the end and go, Jesus is God who calms our fears. And that's what we want, right? I want that. I want when, I, when I'm fearful, when I'm anxious, I want God to calm those things. Uh, but the reality is it doesn't always happen, right? Uh, sometimes, sometimes we just still fear, feel anxious. Sometimes there's still fear. And we just got to go, Jesus is God with us in our fear. Uh, and that's okay. And so here's what we want to do today is we're going to actually look at Isaiah 43. This is, this is where we're going to kind of couch our morning. Like I said, most of this series has, has unpacked Isaiah, 
and then we've, we've tied it to the person of Jesus and what he's accomplished. Um, and we're going to do that again today. Uh, but Isaiah 43, uh, part of the reason we've done this series this way, by the way, is that Isaiah is kind of the most all-encompassing uh, book of prophecy about Jesus. Uh, no, other, no other Old Testament book has more prophecies about Jesus, and then no other Old Testament book of prophecy is quoted more than Isaiah in the Gospels. And so most of the time when you read the Gospels and it goes, as the prophet said, it's usually talking about Isaiah. And so that's part of the reason why we're there. But Isaiah 43, verse number two says this. When you pass through the waters... I will be with you. And through the rivers, uh, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. See, part of Emmanuel, God with us, is the reality that God is with us through all of it. Uh, We we weren't promised a fear-free life. Uh, we weren't promised, uh, but, but what we were promised was a life accompanied by God. Uh, I, think, uh, I think we look at this and we go, you're going to pass through the waters, uh, and rivers will try to sweep you away, and fire will come and consume. Um, and I think we want Scripture to tell us, and God will make it all better and take it away, but the reality is we're not promised a fear-free life. We're promised a life that God accompanies us in. We're promised that God will never leave us or forsake us, no matter how deep the waters get, no matter how how fast the river runs, no matter how big the flame burns. We're promised a God who's with us. And that's got to be enough, right? And so here's what I want to do before we get uh, before we get too far into this is I I, I want to just point this out in a lot of life we have uh, we have either ors that happen right we're like I am conservative and then on this side we've got like well I am liberal um, or maybe you have like well I am not vaccinated and over here you're like well I am vaccinated and there's this like oh, moment right where we want either or uh, theology the study of God people tend to do the same thing. And they look at a passage like this, and especially like old Baptist churches will do this thing where it's like, man, God is going to, God, you're going to go through trials even if you love God, and life is going to be hard, and you're going to lose things, and and you're going to have to abandon your brother, and and, and you're going to have trials, and it'll get better when you're in heaven, but life here could be really bad. And then those people often point to the other side of the category where it's like, hey, well, well you're, you can experience complete victory in Jesus. And if you, if you name it and pray about it and claim it, it'll be yours. And, uh, and, and all good things will come to you because you, if you have enough faith, God will provide. And I actually think both of those categories are wrong. Uh, I don't think either of those categories are right. Usually when we uh, go to extremes, we're wrong. And I think that that's true in this case too. And so here's what I want to, I want to make sure you hear me say this morning. Is I'm not telling you that you should be fearful and anxious if you're a Christian. Right? I'm not saying that. Uh, you know, if you're, only, you're only in the will of God if you're afraid of something. That's not true. But what I am saying is you could be right in the middle of the will of God and experiencing great fear. Right? And so that's what we're, we're talking about here. Life is really confusing, and we can be in God's will and be afraid and be anxious and be worried and be scared and be stressed. That's what happens, right? And so here's what I want to do now is, is I want to show you God's promise is to be with us in those moments. God's promise is to, to never forsake us in those moments. And so what we're going to do is we're actually going to go to Exodus chapter 14. I don't have this on the screen because it's a longer passage of Scripture But Exodus chapter 14, if you want to go there in your Bible. Uh, But here's what we're doing is Isaiah is talking about Jesus and him coming and what he provides, which is great. What we're going to talk about on Christmas Eve is Jesus' birth, because that's what you do on Christmas Eve. Uh, What we've talked about is stories of Jesus, right? But what I want to do is I actually want to look at the reality that God has been present with his people uh, long before then. And that while we don't have Jesus walking with us, uh, we still have the presence of God with us. And so we're going to look at an old story where Jesus wasn't walking with him, but God was present. Uh, It's one of my favorite stories in all of scripture, actually. And this historical account from Exodus is about the Israelite people. And if if you're familiar with Exodus, what you know is the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. And uh, they were slaves in Egypt, something about two million of them at this point in time. And uh, through through, uh, lots of pain and crying out, God delivered them. 
10 plagues came and Pharaoh was like, please just leave. Um, and so they left and he uh, actually fulfilled a prophecy from Genesis where they left with a lot of money and livestock and wealth that they didn't have when they went into Egypt, which is just a cool thing that God did. But they were freed from Egypt and they uh, were on their way out and they left, like I said, with tons of wealth and livestock and good things right in the middle of what God wanted to do. And then Pharaoh is like, wait a minute, we actually needed them. Uh, you know, something about two million slaves disappearing is a big deal. Uh, and so he would like to have them back. And that's where this story in Exodus chapter 14 picks up. He, he gets his army ready to go and travel with them. And so in verse number five is where we'll start today. It says this, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed towards the people. And they said, what is this we have done? That we have let Israel go from serving us. So he made ready his chariots and took his army with him. And took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of, Egypt's, of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and all his army overtook them and camped by the sea. If you're wondering, I'm a youth pastor, not a theology major. This is Phi Haharath, that feels right, and Baal Zaphon, that feels good, right? Okay, next, uh, next verse, verse 10. It says this, when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. They feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us to bring us out of Egypt? Is not this what we had said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Right, they're in the middle of a great panic. And the story continues actually in verse 13 with this. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which, will, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. And the Lord will fight, you, uh, the Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. What a crazy passage, right? There's this idea that the, the Lord himself will fight for you, that he'll fight uh, for them. But here's what I also know. Uh, when, pe when you're like worried about something and people are like, yo, just chill, it's going to be fine. Uh, that doesn't usually help, right? Uh, and so I don't imagine the people of Israel are like, oh, we're good then, right? I have a feeling panic still was there. The fear was there. But this is what happened next. If you look down in verse 15, the Lord said to Moses, uh, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. Verse 21 is where I'm going to skip down to. The Mo then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by the strong east winds all night and made the sea dry land. And the waters were divided, and the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And if we skip down to verse 26, we see how it ends. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal course. When the morning appeared and as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The water returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the hosts uh, of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, and the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and their left. I love that story. Uh, there's this story about the, the power of God and what God wants to do. But let me, let me recap this. The Israelites are freed, and things are good. God has freed them, and they're headed on their merry way uh, to their new land that they're looking forward to. And suddenly, Pharaoh realizes what he's done. He's let all of his employees, uh, maybe is what he wanted to call them, go. And Pharaoh's army decided, we're going to set out after Israel. 
and we know his army and chariots are following. And here's what I imagine. You know when you're like near a highway, you can hear it. And as you get closer, it gets louder and louder and louder. And what I imagine is that some two million Israelites are uh, heading, heading uh, away from Egypt. And then all of a sudden they start hearing this noise. And they're like, do you hear that? Uh, and then they realize, oh my gosh, we've seen Egypt's army. We know what this is. And so they begin to fear, probably even, I would bet, led a little bit by Moses, where, they, uh, where, their, where their walk uh, turns into a little bit of a, a quick walk and into a jog and then into a full-out run because they're like, it, they're coming, they're coming. And what they do is they're panicking and they get all the way uh, as fast as they can running and they get to the edge of the sea and they realize we've run out of space. Right? There's nowhere else for us to go, and all we can hear is them coming. Why, God, have you done this? Why would God take us out of Egypt? We thought we were in the middle of God's plan, and here we are. We're just going to die. Everything's going poorly for us. Why would this happen? And then Moses pauses, and he goes, hey, God is going to fight for you. All you have to do is stay quiet. And like I said, I go, I would have been like, okay. And my, uh, my, my moment of shouting and freaking out would have just turned into like, what is that guy think he's talking about? You know, and I would have quietly grumbled instead, but I still would have been really angry. And then I would have watched Moses walk to the edge of the water and do the thing with his staff. And I'm like, what is that crackpot up to? Like, what is happening? And I, I imagine Israel felt that way too. Because they're like, what is he talking about? And, uh, and then as the wind comes in, they're like, this isn't enough. It's the army of Egypt. This is the most powerful army on the face of the earth. A little wind isn't going to do anything. And then over the course of the night, the water starts to separate. And I imagine, I imagine probably the, the older people among the Israelites, probably the old women first and then the older men, uh, started going, wait a minute. Maybe God is up to something. And the rest of the Israelites actually followed along, and they realized, like, God is doing something here. And then as the ground gets dry, they, they go, I guess this is it. And so they cross in. But if you're a logical person uh, heading in, first off, the story is kind of crazy. But secondly, as you head in between the walls of water, you go, won't they just follow us here too? And so I imagine the same thing happened. They probably started in a walk and then got into an all-out sprint and were carrying young kids, trying to get to the other side because they know what's coming. And they don't know where the, the run is going to end, but they're trying to escape Israel. And, uh, and then they get to the other side, and it's too late. They turn around, and they see the army of Egypt. Uh, the army of Egypt has run into the sea. And they're like, this is it. We're, we're never going to outrun them. And then Moses walks to the edge again and uh, does exactly as God instructs. And the sea closes in on the army of Israel, on the army of Egypt. And, and that's the last we see of him. And he does exactly as he said he was going to do. And I imagine the Israelites were dead silent. What do you do when you watch that happen? You know, God, has, God has just delivered us. And here's what I know from this story. Uh, what I know from this story is, is God led the, is, the Israelites through the wilderness by a pillar uh, of a cloud and a pillar of fire uh, and was able to pull this off, right? So as, as they knew they were in the middle of God's plan, they're following this pillar wherever they go. And when they get fearful, God delivers and fights for them. What about in our life? We, we, we know the person of Jesus came and lived and fought for people. He was present with people and fought for people. And then we go, but what about today? Jesus isn't with us today, but Jesus promised something that was better. He said, uh, actually, as Christians, the Holy Spirit will come into our lives. And that means the presence of God is always with us wherever we go. He'll never leave us or forsake us. His, his, job, of, uh, his job is to, to comfort us uh, and be with us in our fear. And we look at that story and we go, if God, who's leading people by this pillar can do that then what could God do for me today right what could God do in my life today they were right in the middle of God's plan they were right in the middle of what God had for them they were full of fear God fought for them and delivered them right what about in your life as well and here's what I want to do is I want to look at what scripture says about uh, the person of Jesus. And we'll look at uh, just another passage here. It's Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, and it says this. It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and uh, shall call his name 
Emmanuel. Emmanuel is God with us. Jesus came to go, hey, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not just fighting for you, but I'm with you. Uh, Jesus came to show what it looks like to actually have God with us, to have God present in our fear, to have God comfort us, to have God fight for us. And at Christmas, we get reminded of that every single year. And then we get to turn and look at what Jesus said was coming, the Holy Spirit, and go, now that is present in me, and it's present in you, and it comforts you, and it's, and it's there no matter the fear. And so that's the, the gift of God incarnate. And then what happens is in Isaiah 45, 2, it says this, Turn to me and be saved, all the er- ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Right? I love that. We look at this passage and he goes, hey, not only am I coming to be with you, but I'm coming to save you and deliver you. Uh, Not only am I coming to be with you, but I'm coming to save you and deliver you. And when life gets confusing, I'm present. And when, when fear becomes overwhelming, I'm there. And, and that's the promise of God, and I love that end right there, for I am God and there is no other. The, the armies of Egypt are not enough for the presence of God, right? We look at the, 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 the fear in our life is not enough for the presence of God. The, the, the anxiety or stress or panic that you may feel is not enough for the presence of God because he is God and they are not. And I love that promise of him. And so we look at this. What is better uh, than, uh, than the presence of God and the gift of his salvation? Nothing is better than the presence of God and the gift of his salvation. Thousands of years ago, God fought for the Israelites in the middle of their fear. Uh, through Isaiah and other prophets, God promised that he would send his son to be with us. And then in the person of Jesus, God came to be with us, to be present and to save us. And then he promised today that we would have the Holy Spirit in us, that he would be present with us, that he would never leave us or forsake us. And this promise that God is is God and there is no other is still true. And so today we have the Holy Spirit in us and we know that God is with us, but we could still be full of worry. We could still have seasons of fear and anxiety. We could still have panic or stress. And life is really, really confusing. But here's what we know. We have a God who's who's with us in our fear. Look at this. Jesus is God with us in our fear. And so as we process some of that, here's what I want to do is I want to tell you, what do you do with this? I've got uh, a few ideas uh, of what you can do maybe this week as you get ready to uh, welcome Jesus on Christmas Eve. Uh, here's, here's some ideas that I have. The first one is this. Uh, turn to Jesus for comfort and salvation. Here's what I know is you might, be, uh, you might have been dragged along with the family you came to visit for Christmas, and I'm really glad you're here. And I know that uh, if you're not a Christian or you got brought along by whoever you're with, uh, I know that fear and worry and stress are true in your life too. And I want you to know that God is big enough for your fear and worry and stress as well. And uh, God can do something in your life. And so we have a prayer team every week that's here. They're in the back. They go to the sides of the rooms as we close with worship and after service. And I would totally invite you to go and chat with them and pray with them about what it looks like to let Jesus be your comfort and salvation. If, uh, if you're watching online, the moderators can tell you how to get in touch with, uh, with one of our staff. And we can talk uh, this week about the exact same thing. Uh, the second thing that I was thinking about is probably for the, the second two are probably for the rest of the room or most of the room. But it's this, ask yourself, what fear am I letting control me? What, what stress am I letting control me? When, when I go to bed, what's the last thought I have? What's this thing that is distracting me from God? Uh, I think a lot of us have those things. And so what I would do is I would encourage you again. We've, we've got people who would love to pray with you today about those things. Uh, what I would do is I would encourage you to, to the, the, maybe the, even the person you came with, uh, a close, uh, trusted Christian friend or family member is a great person to talk about this with. Or uh, if you would, you can, you can email office at faithkent.org and we would love to connect you with some of our counselors. We have a, a huge resource list that we use. Uh, I, I, send, uh, list, I send people names all the time. Just sent one actually just a little bit less than a week ago. Totally normal for me to do that, and I would love to do that for you as well. If you go, actually, I think I need more than just a a hot second in a worship center. I think I need somebody to process with. And we've got names, and I would love to pass those on uh, to you. And the third one is this. Uh, And this is maybe if you're going, hey, this is a great Christmas. 
Uh, there actually isn't family fighting. Uh, I don't have a lot of fear or stress or worry. Uh, and, and I already call myself a Christian, and this one's for you. Uh, identify who in your life uh, needs this message. Who in your life do you know that's always worried about something? Who in your life do you know that has a closed fist and is fearful all the time? And maybe it's time to, to reach out to them. I, I would encourage you, a lot of people have days off coming up and they've got time with family, but not every day is packed. Maybe a, a phone call, but even better is go, uh, let's go get coffee or let me buy you lunch and let's just talk about your life. And, and you know, you can eventually work your way to a conversation about going, hey, did you know there's a God that's bigger than your worry and fear too? Uh, and you go, well, that sounds kind of awkward. Yeah, it's awkward because uh, you don't do it very often. But once you practice it, it becomes more normal to bring it up. And you can start with a simple conversation and get there as well. And, uh, and I promise you, you could set some people free from their fear and worry and stress. Uh, but that's what we've got. I want you to think about that as you lead into this, as you lead into Christmas, so that at Christmas you could be present with family and you could be present with God. I want you to know that Jesus is God with us in our fear, that he can save you and comfort you, uh, that, that, he can, that he can take the fear that you're holding on to from you, and that he can do that for your friends and family as well. And on the days where that doesn't seem to happen, know that God is with you and he's comforting you even in the midst of it, right? Let me pray for you, and uh, we'll bring worship back up to close out. God, thanks so much for this story and this passage. Thanks, God, that you came to, to be with us. God, that you love us, that you care for us, that you comfort us in our fear. Uh, God, when we're uh, anxious and worried, we're grateful for your presence. And today, Lord, we want to ask that, uh, that uh, you can take the fear that's holding us captive. Uh, and if you don't, God, can you show us your presence when we're in the middle of it? As we, as we turn from afraid to anxious to panicked, uh, can you remind us that you're with us? That you're, that you're uh, comforting us as we go? God, for those of us that find ourselves far from you today, can you give us a safe person to talk to? Hey, God, as we think about our friends and family this season, uh, can you point us out? Can, can you make it clear to us maybe who is in the middle of worry and needs to hear this as well? We're grateful for who you are, Lord. We love you. In your son's name we pray. Amen.